Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Spiritual Spotlight series. Today, I'm joined by Rick Delarada. He is a world-renowned jazz artist, philanthropist, entrepreneur, life coach, and a spiritual thought healer. Rick, thank you so much for coming on the Spiritual Spotlight series. I'm so happy you're here. My pleasure, Rachel. So, Rick, your journey in creating Jazz for Peace started on the rooftop less than a quarter mile from ground zero during the horrifying events of 9-11. Can you share how that pivotal moment shaped your understanding of the role music can play in both healing the individual and collective traumas? Well, you know, I had always noticed it was something I noticed and I kind of kept it inside me. And I was. I wasn't sure if it was only something that world globe trotting musicians knew or, you know, if everybody, how many people, if everyone knew it and they weren't really, you know, uh, doing anything about it. But when I saw those events, um, I started to realize that, you know, this was a unique way for me to play a role in, um, you know, in a reverse kind of way, in a, in a healing way, instead of a, you know, instead of a detrimental way, instead of being problem, part of the problem, I could really be part of the solution due to the, my knowledge that, and that I'd seen it firsthand and I'd seen it with my own music and playing music of other people, saw how it broke through every barrier that divides us, music and arts and culture break through and unite us. And, um, you know, just one thing led to another, starting with a poem, called Jazz for Peace that I wrote on that rooftop. Just kind of the words just kind of came out as I was, you know, experiencing this, these unprecedented, this unprecedented yeah. day. Yeah. Now, have you, were you always like uh, from the time you were a child until adulthood, always a musician? You know, a lot of people have asked me that. I did have one other job in my life and it was as a paper boy. I love so that. <laughs> I was delivering the papers and I was kind of ambitious about it. You know, I was a little kid and I was maybe 13 years old, ride around the bike and I would, you know, fold the paper, ride with no hands on the handlebars, fold the paper, crack it, whip it to the door. Uh, so it was, yeah, exactly. That was me, like the gunslinger with the paper. But uh, one thing led to another and I really had to just drop out of the paper routes after, um, you know, I think the first thing that happened was my homeroom teacher, his son's had a, wanted to start a band to play the mm. high school dances and all that. And uh, so he wanted me to play in that kitty band, you know, for the dances at the schools. And then there was a grown up band that wanted me to play with them. They were going to sneak me in and out of the bars and the clubs, uh, you know, to play in their band for yeah. like more like for private parties. It could be weddings, it could be clubs, whatever. And then on top of that, my mother, who was the church organist, all of a sudden, I need, you know, I needed to relieve her as a church, church organist. She just wanted me to take over for her. I, I'm sure it was for my own growth, you know, right. uh, again, physically. And then by that time I was just overwhelmed with the paper route. So that was That's about, too much. yeah, that, I, that was my last, that was my last job so far, you know? <laughs> Every, when you're saying Paperboy, all I have is that moody movie, Better Off Dead, coming to mind. Well, I want my two dollars. Like the Paperboy looking for his money. Like I want my two dollars. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a great scene because we did. You I used to have to go and collect from people in strange places and get a little. You know, they get a little bit riled up that I was there. But you know, I was like, well, your wife told me that you were here. You know, what do you want me to right. do? You're three months. You're a month and a half late with the paper. You know, you gotta. Pay so, your bills. Yeah. <laughs> so you've been described as a life coach and a spiritual thought healer, in addition to being an accomplished jazz artist. How do you blend your musical gifts with spiritual coaching? And how do you use these two facets of your life to synergize? Well, you know, it really started when I started doing the benefit concert series with Jazz for Peace to help outstanding causes. And I realized that, you know, all outstanding causes were in need of the same things. And, uh, you know, one of them was to grow their donor base. Another was to rejuvenate mm -hmm. the, the people that they had. Um, another was to get sponsors and new and prestigious supporters and publicity and awareness, raise funds, all of that stuff. And then I noticed that, you know, it uh, a lot of these things just transfer to individuals. You know, we are kind of an empowerment tree ourselves that needs healing and needs growing and needs nurturing. And so, you know, you're kind of transferring it from, you know, an organization as a whole to individuals as a whole. And yeah. you kind of just see these correlations. And then you find that you're able to spot something or say something in someone that makes a difference 
And um, it's exciting for both people. I mean, it's exciting for them uh, just to, you know, get some get some relief, you know, in terms of an issue they're having. And then it's really exciting for me to say, wow, did I really make a difference? You know, and so it's a surprise for me as well. Well, I mean, the thing is, is that in for myself as being someone who is spiritual and also a healer, music plays such a valuable role in healing. Even if you're, you don't even have to be spiritual, the, the power of music can really like, I feel like it's a universal language. And I'm sure you've seen that with a lot of your clients, how it's just, it's uplifting, it's positive, it helps to take you out of a rut. Have you seen that with a lot? I'm sure, I mean, you've had a ton of concerts with a lot of people that have watched you or maybe been coached by you. Absolutely. Well, you know what it is? It's, um, it's, it's, it is, like you said, a universal language. It's spoken everywhere. Even when you get into specifics, like let's say the art form of jazz, there's yeah. no place I can go to, no country I can go to, where the, there won't be either someone who speaks that language in terms of a musician or a listener who has developed a uh, you know uh, an ability to an appreciation for it you mm. know I, and you can hear you can sense them in the audience. You can feel their energy. I remember once I was in the south of India. And I was playing for people who I knew had never heard jazz before in their lives. Yeah. Really remote place in the South of India where I was. And the strangest thing, because I'm playing for all these people and the music is going through, I'm, I'm watch almost watching the music pass through the people, you know, and it's passing through and it's in a, like, um, in a way that's being kind of like, appreciated at a at a you know a certain level of enjoyment and like enjoyed like that and then there's this one little spot in the concert hall where it's just going thug it's just like being like like immersed and yeah. swallowed and how would you say consumed yeah i'm noticing it in the concert hall and i'm like who it who are those three who are those three people yeah. sitting in that concert hall? And I realized that the music kept going and it was completely being devoured by these three people. And I was like, I've got to meet these people. They can't be from here. And they said, you know, they, and, and so somehow we found each other and I said, you guys, where are you guys, you know, what's up? Because something's up here. I, I know. Yeah. And they said, we heard about your concert and flew in from another part of India. They're jazz enthusiasts. And they had flown from another part of India to this remote part and attended my concert just to come to the concert. And, you know, I could sense them. I could feel them in the audience yeah. because they were hearing it from a whole nother level. You know, not that one was better than the other. I mean, the, the, there was an honesty and a beauty to the other people hearing it for the first time, but the other people were, it was, a, you know, it was going, it was going in through them. You know what I mean? Yeah. They were, the notes that I could tell they knew that they could, they knew what I was doing. They knew where it was coming from through their, you know, intellectual appreciation for it that they already had brought to the event. I think that's such a beautiful thing. And also you, as you know, you're a world renowned jazz artist, the fact that you were able to sense their energy and to sense them out in this, you know, event, and then to take time out to actually meet with them and talk with them. Like, I don't know a lot of artists that would do that. And I think that's amazing that you were able to intuitively connect with them and then kind of talk to them about their experience. And you were able to see that power of your music just through them. Well, absolutely. But, you know, it's also a rare thing where you'll have, you know, a whole bunch of people at one level and yeah. three people at a whole nother level. You know, it's just such. It's, it's like, so hello. <laughs> yeah, because that won't happen. You know, let's say here in New York or something like right. that. I mean, there'll be people at different area, but the, the you know, the sound will, you know, it'll go through and it'll. Right. It does its own little thing, you know, its own meandering, uh, similar similar to um, what do they call that? The the energy, the jet stream, like almost like a jet yes. stream. Yeah, like a jet stream. But in this situation, because of those, you know, it was just the craziest. Yeah. So I was like, I was almost like, I got who the heck is that? You know, I mean, that just sounds like a really cool experience, like for you and for them, as that just sounds amazing. So with over 850 concerts to date, each much carry a unique energy and a message. I know we just talked about this one, but is there maybe a particular concert that stands out as a defining or transformative moment in your journey? 
Well, you know, there's so many. I know it's a lot. (laughs) I mean, you could make a whole podcast out of each one of them because like I told you, that was just one part of this experience in India. But I mean, you know, there's nine different trips to Africa, all that have been completely different. There've been, you know, South America, you know, Canada, Brazil, Mexico, everywhere. So there's so many different things. But, um, you know, I noticed that something might have changed in my life, maybe when I actually read the poem, because um, before that I was, you know, Rick Delarada, the jazz artist, just like all my friends still are, you know, all of all of my friends in music, they're still them. I'm, you know, I have this other element now. Right, right. Uh, what happened was I'd written the poem and then the country was closed down. And then right when it opened, I just opened just in time for me to get to a jazz festival where I was headlining and there was going to be 8,500 people there. And when I read that poem and I just read the poem, uh, but that was something started to change mm-hmm. at that time because people were so moved by the words and I didn't know if anything, you know, again, I didn't know it, but it, it was this, the change, a change had started because yeah. now people were associating me with words that I wrote from an event that I experienced, uh, you know, and offering a solution through those words. Yeah, absolutely. Like you're offering them peace like right. that to me, just for going through nine 11, you know, that was such a traumatic event for our entire nation. And then for you to, like you said, you wrote this poem and then to come out for this concert, I would imagine like all of the energy was just kind of like heavy, but then lifting as you're reading that poem. I just, I find that fascinating. Well, it was, you know, it it was uh, the probably most, for most people is their first event since the country was locked down. Mm. So yeah, it was an emotional experience for all of them. But I just noticed that I was like, in the back of my mind, I sense it's possible that my life could be changing from this moment, you know? I love that you were keyed into that though. Like you, you were, you were kind of like intuitively connected to look, like, I know I have a bigger mission here. I have a bigger purpose here, you know? And for people that are on a spiritual journey, like it's like that inner, like, did you have that like inner nagging, like not nagging, but like inner, maybe inner cheerleader, just kind of like, all right, look, you, you need to be doing a little bit more. You've got a bigger mission here. Well, you know, what would, what it would be was just one thing would lead to another. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm sitting here with this poem and I'm like, there's something kind of significant about the fact that I just witnessed this event and I have something to show for it. You know, right. everyone else is running around trying to give blood or whatever they're doing and, you know, right. all the news and the blah, blah, blah. But I, I have, I have something to show for this that's always going to exist, you know, the words to this poem. And so I didn't know, but I I had a feeling like, hmm, sometimes when you do something significant, there's something that follows it. And then who the heck knows, something could follow that, follow that. You could be off and running on a journey, who knows, depending on what happens to you. You're right. I mean, the thing is, is that once you're like, I feel like the universe will support you once you're in, like you said, you're following the path and then it's almost like, okay, here's the next thing. Here's the next thing. And it, and that energy opened up and you were, you took aligned action, which some people don't, you took aligned action and you continue to move forward, which is amazing. You know, cause some people get stuck in, well, I have this thought, but I'm not going to do it, but you did it. I, th- I agree with you with that. You know, I think, see, as a musician and an improviser, this is another thing, another mm-hmm. reason why I'm an advocate for the arts and culture is because uh, if you're involved in something like, let's say jazz, where you're improvising and you're going to make something up or something, or you're going to mm-hmm. do something spontaneous, you have to open up a channel to allow that to come through. Yeah. And what you're talking about there is what a lot of people do. They block the energy from coming. They block it themselves, you know? They just, by, you know, not having, they just don't have the intuition to say, hey, wait a minute, let me just open and allow rather than close and try to control the the situation, you know? I mean, there, there are much greater things out there than us little people so we might as well keep the door open and allow yes. that energy like you're talking and about. i think it's really hard for some people to do that like you're you're used to being a channel like you like you like you said you improvise you're a musician you're used to kind of channeling that energy but for other people you know they get stuck in it and they also get used to you know being comfortable with uncomfortable because i think people get stuck in fear they get stuck in the well i don't know what that is so not for me you know? 
Yeah, and also that fear can cause you to think, which shuts the channel. Yeah, everything shuts the channel, guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, yeah, well, you know, when people practice meditation, yes. they actually are, you know, they, they tell you do not, you know, you, you have to like just let let things flow. You yeah. have to allow, you know, I guess the word a bit is allow, you know. Allow, but, and, and what I like to do is I like to say, like, I'm going to surrender to the universe. And when I do find myself maybe, maybe, you know, shifting into a little bit of, mm, I don't know about this. What I will do is I will call, I will, as I will call in my team and I'll say, just give me one divine aligned action to take. I'm feeling a little, yeah, give me one. And then I'm going to trust it. And I'm going to follow it, you know, but I like with the meditation too, because you're right. Like I'm somebody who's like, I'll text my friend. Am I meditating correctly? Am I doing this right? How long am I supposed to be doing this? Why am I? Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's hard <laughs> it is it is it's tricky it's tricky, tricky. it's tricky so yeah. um let me ask you this so jazz for peace has been in a, involved in numerous philanthropic activities including mm -hmm. teaching mothers to read um to save off terrorist recruitment in pakistan can you elaborate on how these initiatives align with your broader mission of peace building through music well, and that's a good one that you brought up because that was just another one of these amazing kind yeah. of miracle things that I, I never thought would actually happen. And the way it, it evolved and developed was so amazing. I didn't even know myself uh, the the a massive amount of illiteracy that was going on in that country. And I was actually tipped off by a Walmart worker in Seattle out of the blue who just called me on the phone and said, I have been following this thing going on with you in Pakistan, the, you know, the, the sponsors and the this and the that. And, um, you know, we were at a standstill where I was telling the people, look, we have a model, but you've got to complete the steps. Mm. You can't go to this step until this step is complete. And this guy completed the step because he was so knowledgeable about the problem because he was fixated on his belief that is that kids needed to learn how to read and that it was a big, big problem, yeah. you know, with uh, them having limited options in life and all that. So, uh, like I said, it was just, I was allowing, I was allowing, I was definitely allowing, but I wasn't betting the ranch on anything. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm going to allow this, but yeah, I'm not going to bet the ranch on, on this coming through, but if it comes through, that's fine. And yeah. this guy just kind of put it, he became the, the, you know, the, the final piece yeah. of the puzzle that confirmed the event. But what I wanted to say about that is what I found that we're able to do at Jazz for Peace is we're able to take a baton that was brought this far mm -hmm. by all of the other people before us, whether it was Gandhi or Martin Luther King or John Lennon or all of these great people that played a part, a role in peace. And now we're taking the baton and we're saying, listen, we can redefine peace now through all of these good works we're now using the arts and culture to help the world's most outstanding causes and bring them to the forefront. And we're generating peace in that way by not only helping that cause, but now that cause is able to help all the people that they serve. And so we're touching all of these people in a positive way. That just sounds so beautiful. I mean, really, it just sounds so amazing. So let me ask you this, as a multifaceted personality, how does your entrepreneurial spirit contribute to your musical journey and the outreach for Jazz for Peace? And how do these different roles nourish your soul? Well, I a lot of people just don't realize it. And, and I didn't until I just kind of got in. You know, sometimes the, you you don't find out, you don't find out things. You can't find out from the, uh, what is it? The, um, uh, where the train takes off. You know what I mean? From yeah. the, yeah, that little, you know, when you're waiting for the train, there's only so much, you know, but the journey teaches you a lot. Yeah. So from that journey, I was realizing, wow, I'm getting rich here from the achievement of it, mm. you know, from, from the people, from being able to make a difference and, and being able to help people and being able to play such an important role in their eyes, in their success. So it was gaining me, you know, so all of that is, um, it's all complementary to your existence in the arts because yeah. the arts in general is a gift to the world. You know, you're, you're doing something with your art to make a positive difference. And this really supersizes it, you could say. Absolutely. And, and I love the fact that you brought up, like, it's a journey, not the destination. 
and you've taken time to actually enjoy the journey and to be able to look back and be like, oh yeah, I did this. This is amazing. You know, and that's the really journey cool. is so, yeah, the journey is so important and musicians will find it out when they're studying because, uh, you know, there's like these, um, things where you would see a great jazz pianist, you'd watch a video of him and someone is telling him, show me this, show me that. And he said, and he would say to them, I'm thinking specifically of a jazz pianist named Bill Evans, but there's a video where his brother was a professor and he wanted to interview him. And he said, you know what? It's the journey of discovery yourself at the piano, not the actual copying of the other person's voicings, but discovering them yourself, you know, and that's true. It's the discover, it's the journey of yeah. the discovery. And then knowing when you're discovering something that unique to you, things that, you know, nobody, I mean, I think everyone has the ability to do something that mm -hmm. nobody else could do, but them. That's one Absolutely. thing. So before I ask you the final question, if anyone is interested in either learning more about jazz for peace or learning about all of the things that you do, what is the best place for someone to reach you? Well, a great thing to do is, um, you know, watch this, for example, watch this podcast. I know you're on a lot of other podcasts. <laughs> yeah. Or a lot of other ones. And, uh, you know, try to learn a bit of a little bit about us. Our website is jazzforpeace.org. Okay. So you can always go there. And then um, there's a website, there, there's another a WordPress site that has a lot of archived information and that's called jazzforpeace.wordpress.com. And if you go there and even add a forward slash about to get to a specific page, you can see all this stuff we've been talking about with all these events. And you can yeah. see what the actual people said, who we performed mm -hmm. for, the organizations and see in their own words and videos and all kinds of archival stuff. So that's great. And then just send us an email at info at jazzforpeace.org. And, you know, that's a great way to get started, especially if you have a little knowledge behind yeah. you and stuff. That is perfect. So our listeners would love to hear you play something for us today. Do you mind? Sure. I think that'd be great. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is actually what we were talking about, because I'm going to make something up completely unique for your show. Yeah, I call it Free J.A., and it comes from a concert I did in uh, Haiti where uh, they said, welcome, Jazz for Peace, and they spelled it J-A-S-S. -S. And that, yeah, that led me to understand that it's actually a Creole word. We've been mm -hmm. spelling it wrong, but that they, it's their word, and it's called J-A-S-S. -S. So I took that off, and now I have Free J.A., which is short for free jazz, but it's also yeah. free JA, which is a little thing we're doing to, to, to stand for freedom of speech and some of these rights that are in jeopardy now. And so I'm going to make that up. It's a free improvisation. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to put a little something familiar in front of it. And this is a song that has a spiritual connotation. It was written by the Beach Boys, but when they interviewed them after, uh, it, it, it remarked a spiritual change in their lives. So it's a little bit of that. It's called God Only Knows. It started that. I'm going to, after that, I'm going to go into something I've okay. never played before. I don't know what it is. We'll find out. We'll, we'll both find out together. And then that's going to finish with the words of that poem that we've been talking about the whole time, the Jazz for Peace poem. And again, I'm going to improvise completely spontaneously underneath that. Perfect. Thank you. Right, I'm gonna, this thing I have to check. Yeah, I'll turn this off and then I can start. All right. I may not always love you, but long as there are stars above you, you never need to doubt it. I'll make you so sure about it. God only knows what I'd be without you. show nothing to me. So what good would living do me? God only knows what I'd be without you. God only knows what I'd be without you. God 
only knows what I'd be without you. jazz for peace coming through the trees in my heart it fills me like a celebration I see the light to follow. that leads to reaching potential that we have in our soul so we can raise our total conscience and see that the gift of giving is our greatest privilege. Are you back? Yes. Thank you so much for playing that beautiful piece. That was really amazing. Thank you. Great. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. And I just want to say again, thank you for coming on the Spiritual Spotlight series. You are amazing. And again, thank you for sharing your gift with us. I really and our listeners will truly appreciate it. My pleasure, Rachel. And you have a great day. Okay.